most disturbing videos in the world part one okay so this video is titled funky town and it might single-handedly be the most disturbing video and thing to ever come on the internet i can't show you the video on tiktok but i can tell you everything about it and word of advice never ever look this up so the video shows a mexican drug cartel executing a man in which they remove the man's face while he's still alive and a lot of other weird and disturbing things start happening and all while this man is getting his face ripped off his body, the song Funky Town is playing in the background, hence the video being called Funky Town. Residents in Salford are calling what's happened in the area like something out of a horror film. Human remains have been found in three locations across Salford, which started when a headless torso was discovered in the area. A horrified dog walker made the discovery recently, which was a male torso wrapped in plastic. A major investigation was launched on the 4th of April, when a member of the public found a lower back and a thigh wrapped in cellophane at Kersal Dale. Police taped the area off and sent dive teams into the reservoir. Police believe that the body parts belong to just one male victim, a man in his 60s. They believe that he passed away around the end of March. They believe that he knew two men, one aged 42 and one aged 68. Now, it's also believed that the pair lived alongside the victim. The two men have now been arrested for murder. Police state that they are looking at four crime scenes in Salford and Greater Manchester and have called the situation a complex and challenging case. The death of actor Philip Seymour Hoffman is one of the saddest stories that I've read about in a long time. If you don't know who Philip Seymour Hoffman is, he was one of the most famous actors in America at the time of his death. And he was one of my favorite actors. He was great in the movie Doubt and Mission Impossible 3. Boogie Nights, The Big Lebowski, he was a very, very talented person. And in fact, during his career, he would win an Oscar, a Golden Globe, an Emmy, pretty much every single award that you can win in the world for acting. For years, Philip Seymour Hoffman had talked in the press about his prior struggles with alcohol and drug abuse, but he always said that he was doing better now. That is, until February 2nd of the year 2014. On that day, he was discovered by one of his close friends, a playwright, dead in his Manhattan bathroom. Apparently, when his friend found Philip Seymour Hoffman's body, there was a syringe still in his arm, and they found heroin, cocaine, and a number of other drugs still in his system. He had died from an overdose that day, and for years he had been hiding his addiction issues from all of his close friends and family. I think that this story goes to show that you should always check on your friends and family, because even if it looks like you have everything you could have ever wanted on the outside, you can still be deeply struggling with your own issues on the inside. And also, rest in peace to Philip Seymour Hoffman. He was truly a gem in the film industry. Imagine escaping the death penalty, only to then be killed by the toilet in your cell. That's exactly what happened to South Carolina murderer Michael Anderson Sloan in 1989. Michael was actually on trial for the murder of 24-year-old Mary Royam. She was found in her West Columbia apartment. She'd been sexually assaulted and beaten to death with an iron. And at the time of that murder, Michael was actually on work release from prison, where he was serving time for robbing a woman at knife point. Michael was found guilty of Mary's murder and he was sentenced to death by electric chair. However, that sentence was commuted to life in prison and he was spared his life. But Michael was still destined to die on an electric chair, albeit a very different one. Michael was attempting to fix a pair of earphones that he had plugged into his TV in the cell. He was sat on his metal toilet seat at the time and he bit down onto the wire of his headphones. He was electrocuted and killed instantly. The coroner said that he had severe burns in his mouth and his death was ruled a tragic accident. Imagine being decapitated at Six Flags theme park. It was the 28th of June 2008. A 17-year-old from Columbia had just ridden the Batman roller coaster at the Six Flags Over Georgia theme park. He'd been attending the theme park that day with his parents and also a group of friends from a local Baptist church. While riding the roller coaster, he realised that he'd lost his hat and after disembarking, he decided that he needed to go and retrieve his hat. He hopped over two fences along with a friend to go and get it. The pair went into the area that they believed the hat to be. 
However, the area they entered was restricted, and it was restricted for a reason, because it was incredibly dangerous for pedestrians. It was actually directly in the path of the oncoming roller coaster. As he was retrieving the hat, the roller coaster full of passengers came towards him at full speed. The ride struck the teenager's head at a staggering 50 miles an hour. The boy was decapitated in front of his friend and the ride full of passengers. Ambulances and police both raced to the scene, but unfortunately the boy was declared dead. The roller coaster was closed after the incident for the day as a mark of respect towards his family, but it was open just a day later. These are the most disturbing 911 calls, part three. 911, what's the address of your emergency? No, there have been a murder. There is no survivors. Please send Okay, help. what's going on? Who, what's going on? Um, my ex-boyfriend broke into my house and killed my current boyfriend and then killed himself. Okay, did you just find them? Um, no, he killed my current boyfriend and then he held me off and then he just shot the that. Just now? Yeah. Okay, stay on the line with me. <laughs> and um, he kind of beat me up, so, and my parents are at home, it's just me and I'm 17. What's his name? Brian White and Jake Burns are the victims. Um, and where's the weapons at right now? What? Where are the weapons at? Where's the, the gun? The gun is, the axe is in Jake, and the gun is in Brian's hand. Where are you at inside the house? Um, I'm sitting in our breakfast nook, uh... Brian's in the living room. There's the kitchen between us. He's he's dead. He's gone. And so Brian killed Jake. Yeah. <laughs> Don't touch anything, okay? Can you do me a favor? Can you go sit on the porch? Yeah. What's your name? Desiree Staper Fenny. Imagine getting married to a man and he then stabs you and buries you alive. It's a miracle this woman survived this horrendous attack. It was October 2022 in Washington. A local resident was woken up just after midnight by banging on her door. She could never have imagined the events that unfolded just prior. The woman banging on the door was crying for help. She'd been beaten up, stabbed, and bound with duct tape. She'd been buried alive in a wooded area nearby. Terrifyingly, she was trapped underground for an agonizing 12 hours. At one point during the attack, she tried to alert authorities by using her Apple Watch. Incredibly, she was able to break free from the duct tape and managed to run and get help. She had dug her way out of the grave where she'd been covered with branches. She then sprinted to that nearby house. When the resident answered the door, the woman explained how her husband had tried to kill her. The harrowing attack came after the woman's husband, Che Kong An, told her he was going to kill. Horrifically, he's actually the father to her children. She'd begged him multiple times during the horrific attack to think of the children, but he didn't. The 54-year-old man was arrested and charged with attempted murder, DV, and kidnapping. He pleaded guilty and has now been sentenced to more than 13 years in prison. The victim states that she lives with the trauma of the attack every single day, as well as multiple health issues as a result. You think of a psychopath in movies and what roles come to mind? Joker, Christian Bale's American Psycho. This movie, right? It's called No Country for Old Men, the main antagonist. Anton Chigurh, played by Javier Bardem. This guy, Anton, is the hitman. Everybody, like psychologists, and they say that he's the most accurate representation of what a psychopath is. For real? Yeah, I'm going to show you a clip. That's the hitman? Yeah. What way would that be? I've seen you was from Dallas. What business is it of yours? Where I'm from? Friendo? Most. You ever lost on a coin toss? Call it. Call it, yes. For what? Just call it. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. It's been traveling 22 years to get here. And now it's here. Wait, so what the fuck is the guy behind the counter? He was just a regular uh, store guy. So he just wanted to mess with him or something? Or he was actually gonna dead ass kill him for a fucking coin toss? No, he was gonna kill him. But he's a hitman. Exactly. Uh <laughs> There's also another scene where it's the very beginning. He like gets arrested and shit. And his face while he was killing a cop. I don't know. It's fucking just like <laughs> Really? Yeah, you want... Let me see. Let me see. Watch. Yes, sir. I got it under control. Blood has no emotion. <sighs> Fuck. That's why... Imagine burning alive in an escape room gone wrong. It was the 4th of January 2019 in northern Poland. 
A group of five teenage girls were in the local area visiting an escape room to celebrate one of their birthdays. Now, escape rooms are extremely popular team building exercises in which you are trapped in a room and you have to solve puzzles or find answers to clues in order to escape. Obviously, the fact that you are literally locked in a room makes things quite dangerous. But escape rooms were relatively new in Poland at the time, so it took this tragedy to highlight the dangers. Just after 5pm on the day in question, a fire broke out. The group of teens were being surveilled by a single member of staff in a room watching via a camera. The fire was caused by bottled gas which was being used to heat the premises. A gas leak sparked a blaze before the member of staff could intervene. By the time the fire was roaring, it was too late. The fire trapped the five girls whose only exit was the locked door. Heartbreakingly, one of the girls managed to call their dad and all she was able to say was help. The fire brigade raced to the scene at 5.21pm, but tragically, all of the girls passed away. It was deemed that the premises had not actually been cleared for commercial use. The owner of the building was arrested and charged with unintentionally causing the five deaths, but I can't see online whether the owner was actually found guilty or not. Leyenda del Trauco. This legend comes from Chile. It's a lot similar to Duende and it has its differences. But I would kind of say this is a little bit more sinister and disturbing. It's said that El Trauco is said to live deep in the forest. It's a short looking man standing around roughly two to three feet. Its face looks messed up and it has a very prominent nose. It carries around a hatchet which he also uses it as a cane to make himself look less intimidating. But the most noticeable thing that makes him way different than the Duende is the fact that he doesn't have feet. He just has as stumps as legs oh sh and it's believed that this creature acts like an incubus what is an incubus a male demon that has sex with sleeping women which is basically what the uh, trauco does so despite it looking really really ugly el trauco will make the woman think that he's a very very handsome man which ends up leading to them having sexual intercourse and impregnate them yo and you would think that oh to avoid him just don't go into the forest right but he doesn't just get his victims through the forest he could go to somebody's house so if he sees a woman that he's really attracted to he would leave some signs to make his presence known and he would wait till it's nighttime to enter her house and starting that same day the woman would begin to have very very sexual dreams and with those dreams he would be able to have sex with them also if you mess with el trauco and you're a man he could just look at you and with his mind just break your bones and also with his breath he'll be able to make you very very ill to the point where either you die within a couple days or even hours bro i think i seen el trauco because he fucked up my face oh my god the squatter posing as a landlord was convicted for fatally stabbing two tenants. This is 42-year-old Philip Nelson. He's in Portland, Oregon. On April 29th, the jury found him guilty of first and second degree murder. The victims were Cassie Leeton and Najaf Hobbs. Nelson will be sentenced on May 24th. This happened all the way back in June of 2020. Police responded to the scene, found both of the victims dead. And then Nelson, of course, fled the scene. Officers found him two days later and booked him originally on two counts of first degree murder. The victims believed that they were renting an apartment from this guy, but in reality, he was just a squatter in the building that was always kind of around. Nelson wanted more money from them, and when they refused, he turned their water off somehow. The two then went down to the basement to try to turn the water back on from the water valve. Nelson followed them down with a 12 inch handmade knife and stabbed both of them. He stabbed them in the back, the neck, and the chest. When asked about this in court, he said he was poking the hornet's nest by turning off the water. This guy is messed up in the head. I think he's gonna get life in prison, probably a minimum like 20 years. Let me know what you guys think about this case in the comment section below. And reminder, these videos are for informational purposes only. Little boy woke up to find his parents and three brothers dead in their home. He was the only one left alive. In November 2022, an episode of Discover Oklahoma aired on TV. The show featured a couple, Jonathan and Lindsay Candy, talking about their experience of living in the area. The pair were described as customers of a local bakery and talked about how much they loved the food. Less than two years later, they would be found deceased inside their home alongside their three sons. It was the 22nd of April 2024. A 10 year old boy placed a panicked 911 call explaining that all of his family was dead. The boy, who is being kept anonymous at the moment, was in his bedroom asleep at the time of the killings. He had his door closed and a fan on. Inside the home was his dad, Jonathan, and his mum, Lindsay, deceased. Three children were also killed inside the home, Dylan, aged 18, Ethan, aged 14, and Lucas, aged 12. 
It's reported that investigators believe the parents got into an altercation. Jonathan is then believed to have shot his wife and his three sons before turning the weapon on himself. The child's uncle named Brent began a fundraiser online to help raise money for funeral costs and the costs of counseling for the boy. The child is believed to currently be staying with his family. The relatives of the child state, our entire family has been left shattered and confused with so many questions we won't ever have answers to. I simply can't fathom what went on, but please hug your family tight. It's going to be a very long healing process for everyone affected. Our timeline is completely messed up and it's going to blow your mind. Up first, for example, Eminem and Picasso were alive at the same time for two years. I don't know about you, but am I the only one that thought Picasso was around in the 1800s? Another one to wrap your head around is that the woolly mammoths were around at the same time the pyramids were being built. But just wait, this is just the beginning. Next, Rosa Parks lived long enough to see the first two Shrek movies in theaters. Like what? Next, when the Declaration of Independence was being signed, nobody knew dinosaurs even existed. Think about that, like dinosaurs weren't even discovered yet. This next one is going to absolutely blow your mind. Cleopatra was born closer to the invention of the iPhone than to the actual pyramids being built. Finally, this next one makes zero sense, but it's absolutely true. Oxford University was founded 300 years before the Aztec Empire. Like how? This teenager laughed as he talked about how he killed his mom. In a notebook, he'd written, you can't spell slaughter without laughter. It was 2012 and Melanie Davis was a 45 year old mother living in Tennessee. Now, Melanie was raising her two sons on her own after her husband had tragically passed away six years earlier. Her youngest son, Zach, had been really struggling since his dad's death. He'd been hearing voices and he'd become really withdrawn. He'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia, but he wasn't actually receiving any active treatment for this. The oldest son was called Josh. On the 10th of August, the family had been out that night to the cinema. They returned home and both Melanie and Josh separately went to their beds and slept. Zachary, though, had a different idea. He got a sledgehammer from the garage and took it to his mum's bedroom. He then launched a vicious attack, hitting her over the head multiple times. He ensured that his mum was dead before trying to set fire to the house with his brother Josh still inside. He used whiskey and petrol to start the blaze, but luckily Josh escaped. He smelt the smoke and fled the property. Neighbours rang authorities and police rushed to the scene. Melanie was found deceased and Zach was tracked down. Chillingly, when he was questioned about the attack, Zachary actually said that he regretted not going and killing his brother with the sledgehammer too. When recalling how he killed his mum, he actually started laughing. Two months prior to him going on trial, he was interviewed by Dr. Phil. In the haunting interview, he chuckles about his mum's murder. He told Dr. Phil that he'd killed his mum because, quote, she wasn't taking care of my family. He then admitted to laughing while he killed his mum. He was eventually given a life sentence plus 20 years for attempted first degree murder and arson. This former mall Santa was arrested for being a pedophile and his charges are some of the most disturbing I've read about in a long time. This is Leander Dewey Jones and in 2016, the 64 year old pled guilty to CP charges. For years, Leander had worked as a mall Santa, meaning that in public he sat in a chair while a ton of little kids got up on his lap and whispered into his ear. He also worked as a magician for children's parties. So Leander was constantly putting himself near children. Well, on May 29th, 2015, Leander brought his computer into a repair shop. And when examining his computer for malware and viruses, the technician discovered something disturbing. There was a file on Leander's computer depicting CP or CSAM. Obviously the police were called after that and what they found was absolutely disturbing. On Leander's devices, they found over 4,000 images and videos depicting CP or CSAM. They also found a further 1,000 images and videos on CDs or floppy disks in his home. Kids that were seen in these videos were as young as six years old. And even more disturbingly, police found that Leander had been caring for two children recently, and he had forced those two children to participate in the production of CP or CSAM. Yes, not only was he a consumer of this disgusting stuff, he was a producer of it as well. And the entire time that he had been doing all this, he had been working as a mall Santa, a magician at kids' parties, and even a pirate. Eventually, Leander was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And hopefully, fingers crossed, that's where he'll be until the end of his days. If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms.
This man snuck into a toilet so he could spy on girls. This took place in the small village of Miyakochi in Japan. And what happened at a school there that year would shock generations. It was February 28th and school teacher Yumi Tanaka was about to make the most disturbing discovery of her life. At about 5 p.m. that day, right before she was about to leave and go home, she decided to go and use the bathroom. And when she entered the cubicle, she noticed something she never saw before. Inside the toilet bowl was a black shoe. Now, the way the toilets worked back then was that the individual toilet was connected to a small sewer tank. So she was confused on where the shoe came from. So she decided to investigate further and peep her head inside the sewer tank. And what she discovered scarred her forever. Inside the tank were a pair of human feet. Upon discovering this, she let out a blood-curling scream and her co-workers came to her aid. Police came and discovered that the feet were connected to a full body in the tank. They tried to remove the deceased human from the pipe, but it was extremely difficult. Firefighters and a crane had to come to assist moving the body and eventually it was pulled out. The person inside was a dead male and at this point was covered in feces and his cause of death was from hypothermia. The man was later identified as 26-year-old Nayaki Kano. It was determined that he was dead for three days and it seems that he voluntarily got into the toilet pipes. They came to the conclusion that he likely squeezed himself inside in an attempt to spy on women using the toilet. This is just disgusting and weird in so many ways and why in the world would this man do this? There's really no pros to it and there's just cons. I really want to know his thought process behind this. Houston man accused of killing his girlfriend and hiding her body in a shallow grave. This is 31-year-old Derek Fisher, and he was accused of shooting his 45-year-old girlfriend. On April 22nd at 3.30 p.m., the police found Jennifer Ramirez's body on the street. It was determined that she died from a gunshot wound based on injuries. Investigators identified Derek Fisher as the primary suspect because they were dating at the time. They found her body inside of a makeshift shallow grave. So obviously some planning, but not good planning, was done during this murder. About five days later, on Saturday, April 27th, they located Derek Fisher. They have booked him into the Harris County Jail and charged him with first-degree murder and tampering with evidence. His court date is now set for July 30th, so I guess in two months we'll see what happens. Apparently, he also has a case going on for some sort of family assault. I mean, it's not looking good for this guy right now, based on those two things alone. For any of my followers from Houston, the body was found on 11,000 Fuqua Street. Let me know your general thoughts in the comment section below. If you're from Houston, have you heard about the story? And as always, these videos are for informational purposes only. Would you withdraw unlimited money from a cash point if you discovered a glitch? That's exactly what happened to Dan Saunders, and here's what happened to him. It was 2011 in Melbourne, Australia. Dan Saunders was a 29-year-old barman. Now, Dan was out one night having some drinks and needed to get some cash out of a local ATM. When he got to the machine, he realized that he barely had any money in his account, but he saw an option on the machine asking if he wanted to transfer funds from his credit account to his bank account. He clicked to see what would happen and it came up with an error message. However, when he then returned back to the home screen, he noticed his bank balance had gone up by $200. He withdrew the money and then tried the hack later on in the evening and realized his bank balance went up to $2,000. He would go on to use this method multiple times, withdrawing more and more money. He found the glitch worked at any cash point. After using this hack for a little while, he noticed that there was a slight delay with the transferring of funds and he needed to keep pressing transfer. Otherwise, the machine would eventually catch up and realize that he was actually in debt. As long as he clicked transfer funds every single day, it never stated that he was in debt again. Now, Dan obviously started spending a large amount of money that he just didn't have, and his girlfriend got so concerned about this, she actually broke up with him. He was by now living a lavish lifestyle. He was going to fancy hotels, going on expensive holidays, and even taking helicopter rides. After three months of this, though, he was experiencing panic attacks and other health issues. He racked up a spend of half a million dollars. He ended up feeling so guilty about this and so anxious that he tried to hand himself into the bank. They didn't seem that interested though. They said they would contact police, but three years passed and he never heard anything. He ended up going to the local newspapers and as soon as the story gained some traction, the police did get involved. He was arrested and charged with fraud and theft. He was given a year in prison and ordered to pay back compensation. 
November 29th, 1980, Granger Taylor left a note on his parents' door stating that he would be boarding an alien spaceship and would be going on a 42-month interstellar voyage. He disappeared that night and hasn't been seen since. Granger was 32 years old and was described as a genius. He worked at a mechanical shop and could basically fix anything, including an old train that he found in the forest. He also had a long obsession with aliens in space, so much so that he actually built a life-size spaceship on his parents' secluded farm in Duncan, British Columbia that he often slept in. In the months before his disappearance, Granger told his friends and family that he was having recurring dreams that aliens were coming to get him and that he was in direct contact with them. He said he couldn't see them, but he could talk to them. Granger always said that aliens would likely arrive in bad weather in order to travel undercover, and that makes what happened to him that night that much more of a mystery. That night, there was a massive rain and thunderstorm on Vancouver Island. Granger left a note on his parents' bedroom door in the middle of the night stating that he was leaving to board an alien spaceship and was going on a 42-month interstellar voyage. On the back of the note was a hand-drawn map of Waterloo Mountain, but no one knows exactly why that was drawn. Granger was last seen leaving a local diner that night called Bob's Grill in his bright pink pickup truck, but after that, he vanished into thin air. The only thing out of the norm reported by surrounding neighbors was that they heard a loud boom that night, but at the time, it was thought to just be thunder. The RCMP conducted a massive search for Granger, but he completely vanished, and it would take nearly six years for any possible clue to surface. In March of 1986, a group of forestry workers found a blast site near Mount Prevo, not far from the family's farm. In that blast site, human bone fragments as well as fragments from clothing and a truck were found. The clothing fragments found were from a shirt that Granger's mom had sewn for him, and the VIN number on some of the truck parts found reportedly matched to his truck. The local coroner concluded that on the night Granger vanished, he was carrying dynamite in his truck that somehow went off at some point, killing him whether by accident or not. According to his family, having dynamite in his truck wasn't unusual for Granger as he would often use it to blow up tree stumps and was very familiar with how to use it. Some people dispute the finding that Granger died that night, and since then, there have been a ton of conspiracy theories made about what exactly happened to him. According to his family, Granger had been doing LSD in the months leading up to his disappearance. But for years after, they would leave the back door to the family home unlocked in hopes that he would one day return home. This former Degrassi actor is one of the worst pedophiles in Canadian history. Trigger warning, this story is extremely disturbing. It's honestly one of the worst I've read about in recent history, so viewer discretion is advised. This is Bird Dickens, born in 1971 in Ontario, Canada. Bird was an actor, and he was known for portraying a character named Scott Smith on Degrassi High. On the show, he played an abusive boyfriend, and in real life, he was just so much worse than that. A lot of Degrassi fans will remember him from his role in this show, but he also acted in a number of other productions. So after his role ended on Degrassi High in 1991, three different women claimed that he had sexually assaulted them. He was charged with these three rapes, but he was acquitted of all charges eventually. But the story got so much darker from there. In 2004, he met his future partner, Dylan Ann McEwen. And in 2016, it was discovered that he had been engaging in deplorable BDSM activities with her that involved minors. And when police executed a search warrant in April of 2016 of the couple's home, they found over a thousand images of CP, images and videos. And each of those individual images depicted some of the most grotesque CP ever recorded. But in 2003, before he met his future wife, he was actually offered a night with a minor by a girl's mother. Apparently, the mother took nude photographs of her own daughter and mailed them to Bird. And Bird then took the girl and her mother to the movies and then engaged in sexual activity with the young daughter while her mother sat in the same room and watched. This is just disgusting. So this investigation by the police actually uncovered thousands of CP images that were shared between Dickens and his wife. And apparently he was a major member on a lot of BDSM and fetish forums online where he found, quote, like-minded individuals that he would swap these files with. And when the police actually went through these files, I feel so bad for the people that have to actually look through this content. The case got even darker. Some of these images and videos actually showed Bird himself engaging in sexual activity with minors. He recorded these sick videos, took these photos himself, then went online and shared these images with people on the internet. Some of his screen names included the names Retro Deviant, Bird Dog, and Sir Dirk. But during this entire investigation, he continued to work in the film industry. He worked on various productions and nobody knew that this investigation was underway. Eventually, though, in the year 2018, he was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. But there's no real justice in the story because in 2020, he was released on bail. That's right, for all of that, thousands of CP images, some of which depicted himself abusing children. He only had to serve about two and a half years in prison. 
These are the most disturbing 911 calls, part two. Hill County 911, what's your emergency? I just killed my children. Excuse me? I just killed my children. Where are you? Um, I'm in the abandoned house on Highway 77 right after you go underneath the highway. One of them's still alive. Hurry. How? Under what highway? You're on Highway 77 where? I'm on Highway 77 right after you go under 35 going towards Milford. Get an ambulance out here to save the one that didn't die. Come on. Hurry up. What's your name? It's called them. Have you already called them? Yes, ma'am, I have. Okay. I need your name. I want to tell your name. Hello? Hello. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. 727 toward Milford. Right after you cross under the bridge, she's telling me she killed her children. Are you in your car? No, I'm not in my car. I'm in the house walking around. And, um, what are you... Colleen Ballinger, a.k.a. Miranda Sings, is allegedly a groomer. But are any of these allegations grounded in reality? Let's go through a quick timeline and examine exactly what she's accused of doing. So if you don't know who Colleen Ballinger, a.k.a. Miranda Sings is, she's a wildly popular entertainer. And like this article states, because of her goofy, over-the-top persona, her content mainly appeals to young children and teenagers. That's why these allegations are disturbing. Colleen has said and done some somewhat troubling things in the past, but it wasn't until recently when all of this came out. So all of this was brought into the public eye when a person named Adam McIntyre really brought this up. He talked about it on YouTube. He made a huge Twitter thread. And let's go through quickly some of these allegations. So Adam was in a group chat with Colleen and a number of other fans who were minors at the time. And I'm just going to show you some screenshots. These are some weird messages that she would say in this group chat. I mean, right here, you can see her talking about sex toys with minors. Here's another screenshot from the chat where she's asking the group, which once again includes minors, to talk about their periods and their bloody underwear. Right here, she's asking an underage fan if they're a virgin. Also asking another fan who's underage what their favorite position is. And I think that Colleen used this group chat to vent way too much about her personal life. Like right here, she's talking about the disintegration of her relationship. Keep in mind, this is a chat which involves impressionable minors. And I mean, just constantly saying strange stuff like this. So in Adam's YouTube video, he goes through all of this. He talks about how Colleen allegedly didn't pay him for work. She allegedly stole content and ideas from him, and she even sent him a pair of her own panties when he was a minor. Which, admittedly, I will say is very, very strange. But then we get into the whole live stage show thing that Colleen does. In the last few weeks, a ton of people on TikTok have come forward and posted about their experiences, which they found to be traumatizing at the Miranda Sings shows. Including this traumatizing experience that a fan had on stage when Colleen invited her up to perform and she played a loud fart noise and basically embarrassed this girl in front of the entire crowd. She had no idea that this was planned and apparently it was really, really impactful to her mental health in a very negative way. There's also this really, really strange thing where Colleen invites young boys, I'm talking about children on stage, and basically invites them to reach into her pants to grab something. And I mean, just look at the expression on her face. I just think it's really odd. And this is something that she's done many, many times, and she actually felt like it was so okay to do this that she made tweets about it, inviting people to come experience this for themselves. There was also another show where she pretended that a young child was pregnant and even stated at one point on video that she smelled fertile, which, once again, I don't think is very appropriate to be saying to a child. She also recently released this response video to all these allegations saying that everyone's just overhyping it and she's basically denying everything that she's charged with. And I don't know, I need your guys' honest opinions in the comments section. Do you think this truly was unintentional? Let me know, because some of these allegations are truly bizarre. However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, like I've known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer, and cannibal. Shirley Temple was absolutely abused by Hollywood. These are some of the darkest things that happened to her. So at age three, Shirley started dancing. And that's when she began to appear in things called baby burlesques, a title which is already just extremely disturbing. And Shirley Temple herself described these films as a cynical exploitation of our childish innocence that occasionally were racist or sexist. She also claimed that when she misbehaved on set at this young age, she was locked in a windowless sound booth and forced to sit on a block of ice. I mean, what? There was also a film role that she had when she was under 10 years old where she played a prostitute. And all you have to do is look at all of the clips and videos of these films that Shirley was in where she's kissing men, they're acting like they're in love with her. 
I mean, it's, it's really disturbing stuff. When Shirley was 12 years old, she signed a contract with MGM Studios. And during her first visit to the studio, she met a producer named Arthur Freed. And according to Shirley, when she walked into his office for a private meeting, he unbuttoned his trousers. He then said, I've got something here made especially for you. She then giggled nervously and the producer kicked her out of the office. This is a moment that she's talked about on shows like Larry King Live. Then, when Shirley was 17 years old, a producer tried to grape her. Apparently, the producer was David O. Selznick, an infamous old Hollywood guy. And one time when he was in private with her, he circled around a couch trying to get to her. She tried to evade him. He even locked the door, but Shirley eventually managed to escape before he could do anything to her. Keep in mind, she was still a minor at this time. She also talked many times about how producers and other people in Hollywood demanded that she sleep with them if she wanted to get a contract or be involved in a new production. And I'm sure that there were so many dark things that happened to her when she was younger that she never talked about, never wanted to bring up again, and things that have been forgotten with time. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. The Shirley Temple iceberg goes really, really deep. Just check out this clip of her speaking on Larry King Live. I went to MGM for one picture, thank goodness only one, and when I got there with my mother, we were separated. She went into the office of Louis B. Mayer, and I went into the office of Arthur Freed, and he was going to talk to me about a, a movie he wanted to put me in. I'm 12 years old, you know, and I thought he was a producer, but instead he was an exhibitor, and I'd never seen anyone naked before, except myself, so I had no clue about what was happening. and. Um, so it struck me so funny, I laughed at him, and I laughed uproariously. I had tears, you know, and he got infuriated. And he said, out, 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 go. Did so you I, tell your mother? Well, I went down. I was very quiet. I went down and met her in the lobby of the administration building. She came out very quietly from Louis B. Mayer's office, and we walked hand in hand silently to the car, which was unusual. We got in the car, driving home. I said, Mom, you won't believe what happened to me. And I told her what happened, and she got kind of quiet. She said, well, you don't know what happened to me. <laughs> And Louis, Louis B. Mayer wasn't as bad as, as Freed was to me. He tried but it. He came on to my mother. <laughs> and so we both decided that we didn't like MGM much. It was, you know, it was better at Fox. <laughs> when a man asked his wife to buy him alcohol, no one could have guessed it would end in murder. Danielle and Skylar Nemetz met in October 2012 on Facebook. Danielle was a junior in high school in California and was described by friends and family as bubbly and friendly. Skylar lived close by and had just graduated. They hit it off after connecting in person at a sports game where Danielle was cheerleading. The relationship started progressing really quickly and Danielle actually ended up moving in with Skylar and his parents. Now this was quite concerning considering the change in Danielle's demeanour. She was a lot more reserved than usual and Skylar made no real effort to get to know her loved ones. Just three months after they met, Skylar proposed to Danielle. She accepted and then worryingly decided to drop out of high school. They ended up tying the knot just five months after meeting. Skylar was working in the army at this point and the pair ended up moving away to Washington as he was stationed in Fort Lewis. Interestingly, the pair enjoyed spending time at shooting ranges. Skylar spent her time with her new puppy and she also got a job. Although she was away from her loved ones, she did stay in touch. However, red flags about the relationship would be noticeable even from afar. Behind the scenes, Skylar was abusive to Danielle. He was controlling and had issues with jealousy and alcohol. Danielle told a friend that Skylar had smashed her phone in a fit of rage. In 2014, Skylar asked Danielle to buy him alcohol for when he got back from battlefield training. They were actually both under 21, so Danielle knew she would have to get someone else to purchase the alcohol. Danielle ended up contacting some guys that she knew who were over the age of 21. However, when Skylar found out about this, he would be incredibly jealous and angry. It was the 16th of October and Skylar just returned home. He ended up drinking and Danielle was on FaceTime to one of her friends and she seemed just her normal, happy self. Minutes after she hung up the phone, she would be dead. A neighbour called police to report gunfire. They arrived to the scene to find Danielle dead. Skylar had shot her and then put all of the firearms in the house away and also disposed of the alcohol. When police got there though, Skylar was acting like he was really distressed. He was calling out for his dead wife. Skylar claimed that he'd accidentally shot her while putting away weapons for the day while she was doing some work on the computer. 
However, that doesn't make sense as to why he didn't then call an ambulance as soon as it happened or try to revive her in any way or get any sort of help from anyone. It also doesn't explain why he wasted so much valuable time hiding weapons and alcohol. At the murder trial, texts from Skylar to Danielle were shown which displayed his emotional abuse. A friend of Skylar also testified at the trial about how angry Skylar was to find out that guys had bought the alcohol. The jury ended up really torn. They felt like Skylar seemed rehearsed and over-exaggerated in court, but then they said so did the friend who testified against him. They felt that it hadn't been proved entirely that Skylar did intend to shoot Danielle, so he was found guilty of first-degree manslaughter. He was given just 13 and a half years in prison. Our timeline is completely messed up and it's going to completely blow your mind. Up first, T-Rexes were around closer to humans than they were to Stegosauruses. Basically meaning they were around closer to iPhones than they were to other dinosaurs. Okay, this next one is going to be insanely difficult to wrap your head around. Harriet Tubman was born in Thomas Jefferson's lifetime and died in Ronald Reagan's lifetime. How does this even make sense and how is this possible? Next up, John Tyler on the left, who was the 10th president of the United States, had a grandson that died in 2020. Keep in mind, that was only three years ago. Next, Ruby Bridges, the first black child to attend an all-white school, is still alive, and she's not even 70 years old. Finally, Charlie Chapman and Ludacris were alive at the same time. Okay, my mind is completely blown now. The story of this American female serial killer will make your hair stand up. As if her crimes are not horrific enough, she earned the nickname, The Giggling Granny. How creepy is that? Nanny Doss was raised on a farm by a very controlling father, and one of the few joys that she had in life was sneaking into her mother's room and reading her romance novels, and she would daydream about the day that she'd be swept off her feet and have her happily ever after. And she got married to her first husband at the age of 16, and it was a miserable marriage. The couple had four daughters together, two of which mysteriously died of food poisoning, at which point the husband took one remaining daughter and fled because he was scared to death of Nanny. The remaining infant baby named Florine was left with Nanny, and Nanny picked up and married somebody new. Now, this man was an alcoholic, but despite that, they were married 16 years and raised Florine together. This is where the bloodbath really begins. Nanny was in the room right after her daughter Melvina had given birth to her second grandchild. And while Melvina was still loopy from the labor drugs and she was exhausted, she could have sworn that she saw Nanny stick a hat pin in the baby's head. Melvina kind of passed out and went back to sleep, but when she came to, she started asking her family members, did Nanny have a hat pin and stick the baby in the head? And the family regretted to inform Melvina that the baby had in fact died. And yes, they did see Nanny holding a hat pin. However, the doctors couldn't give a positive explanation for the baby's death. The death of the baby absolutely shattered Melvina and her husband and they started fighting and drifting apart and Melvina started dating a soldier named Robert who Nanny did not approve of. And one night when Melvina was out of the house and Robert was left alone with Nanny, Robert mysteriously died. And Nanny received $500 in life insurance that she had taken out on Robert a couple weeks earlier. Not long after that, Nanny's husband forced himself on her and she didn't like that so she put rat poison in his corn whiskey jar and he died that night. Nanny married her third husband only three days after meeting him, and he died shortly after this of heart failure. She picked up some life insurance, bought some land, and built a new house. Her late third husband left behind a mother and a bedridden sister who also died shortly after. At this point, Nanny burned the house down, took that life insurance money, and moved on. Then Nanny landed a fourth husband, and at this point, her mom moved in with him. She found out that her husband was cheating, so she poisoned him to death, and for good measure, she poisoned her mom to death, too. Then she married her a fifth man named Samuel Doss, who was very disapproving of the romance novels that she loved to read. He went to the hospital one night with flu-like symptoms and was diagnosed with a severe digestive tract infection. He was treated and sent home. And a few days later, he showed up dead. The doctors were very suspicious of this, so they did an autopsy and found enough arsenic in his system to kill 20 men. Nanny was arrested shortly after this and confessed to killing four of her husbands, her mother-in-law, her mother, her sister, her sister-in-law, and yes, sadly, even the baby with the hat pin. This guy is one of the most awful serial killers there has ever been, and I feel like he's never talked about. In my opinion, this guy's worse than Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer. Hi Meg, I talk about your crime. Let's get into the story of The Butcher, the worst serial killer Canada has ever seen. Robert Picton was born October 24th, 1949, in British Columbia, Canada. Robert had quite a bad upbringing. His dad was very abusive. He actually grew up on a pig farm. From a really young age, him and his brother had to work 
countless hours on this pig farm. And then they were forced to go straight to school without taking a shower or anything. Because he was showing up to school unwashed, Robert started getting bullied and they gave him the nickname Stinky Piggy. As Robert grew older, he was said to be very quiet, but he apparently sometimes had these weird bursts of bizarre behavior. These bursts would come out of nowhere and he would just start acting really strange. In 1996, Robert's brother opened up a kind of charity thing. The charity was started to try to make more money for their pig farm. It was called the Piggy Palace Good Times Society. And what they would do is they would hold huge parties and raves to try and raise money. And I'm not joking when I say huge parties and raves. 17,000 people were said to have shown up at one point. 17,000 people at once. Sex workers and biker gangs would join these parties as well. But for Robert, it all started going downhill in 1997 when he attempted to murder a girl. I don't usually do this in these videos, but a lot of you ask what blush I use, and this is the blush I use. It's usually 10 pounds on the TikTok shop, but it's on for Fiverr right now. So if you click right here, you can get it. I just ordered kind of a peachy version of this. I'm not being paid to talk about this, I just saw they were on offer and you guys ask about these all the time, so get your hands on them for cheap while you can. So Robert attempts to murder a woman for the first time that we know of. According to her statement, he attempted to handcuff her and then he started stabbing her multiple times before she managed to get away. This should have been the thing that got him on police radar, but he was able to get the charges dropped because the woman he attacked was on a lot of drugs at the time and Robert used that to come up with a story. He told police like she was hitchhiking, I was just trying to help her and she attacked me and they believed him because she was on drugs. And unfortunately, for the next 60 women he would kill, he was let go. And he was able to come up with a strategy that wouldn't get him caught next time. He developed a plan and started killing a bunch of women. And Robert was really, really good at staying under the radar. Now, what did he do exactly? Let me tell you. Because it's just, it's disturbing. First of all, he always went for hitchhikers, addicts, or prostitutes. And what he would do is he would promise them money, drugs, accommodation, anything to get them back to his farm. Once he got them back, he would then shoot or strangle them to death. And this next part is why he was given the name the Butcher. He would take the victims' bodies, chop them up, and feed them to his pigs. Now, if you're not aware of this already, pigs will literally eat anything, everything. So the evidence was just, bye. They were getting rid of the evidence for him. All of a sudden, there is an increase in missing women in the area. But sadly, because he only went after sex workers or addicts or hitchhikers, no one cared. And this always makes me so mad with cases like these, like they're still human beings, but no bodies were showing up, so there was no crime, no body, no crime. But as the numbers started rising, people were kind of getting a bit worried. A group of people that weren't the police actually got a list together of all of the names of these young women who were missing. They brought that to the police and were like, do you see now? And that's when the investigation actually began into finding out what happened to these girls. And all of these girls had one person in common, Robert Picton. He was the only person whose name continuously came up when they were looking for these girls. Police needed a way to get onto the farm with a warrant without him knowing about it and hiding all the evidence first. And so they heard that he had possession of an illegal firearm. And so they used that as the cover-up to get onto his property. On the property, they found multiple items that belonged to these missing women, along with some blood-stained clothing and tiny bone fragments. Now, things aren't looking too good for Robert, but because the pigs had eaten all the evidence, basically all of it, they were only able to charge him with the murder of six women. And so he got six counts of murder. When he got arrested, he actually said that he killed 49 women and that he was sad that he didn't get to round up to 50. What the hell, Robert? 
What does he want the police officer to say like, oh, I feel so bad for you. No. He was arrested in 2002 and this trial was huge. Of course, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. But guys, that's not the worst part of this story because I'm getting to that now. One element of the story that I kept out until now is that Robert... <laughs> Robert sold the meat of his pigs to people who lived around the area. These pigs who ate the remains of 60 women were sold to his neighbors. When I say neighbors, I just mean people who live in the area. So like secondhand, cam can secondhand cannibalism. I could never eat pig again if that was me. So yeah, they were pretty um, disturbed and freaked out by this information, which is uh, totally understandable and just totally disgusting. After a huge search of his property, police now believe that the number of women Robert killed was in the 60s. 60 women. 60 mother, daughters, wives. It's insane. It really annoys me with cases like these. I know it was like in 2002 and things have changed, but have they? I find that a lot of cases like these that I cover always start with, oh, all these women were going missing, but they were sex workers, but they were drug addicts, who cares? And it's like, it's insane to me that like, they're not seen as equals to any other woman walking on the street, but whatever, hopefully that changes. And for those wondering, I have actually covered this story before, but the quality of the video was so, so bad that I just, I couldn't keep it up anymore. Like, it really bothered me to watch back, so I thought I would remake it in a higher quality way. I hope you guys enjoyed it regardless, and have a wonderful day. My heart goes out to every single one of the victims, their families, and people who cared about them, um, and I hope Robert rots in jail. Anyways. This is not a good representation of Canadians. We're actually really nice people. I'll see you all in the next video. Love you guys. Bye. This schoolboy stabbed his teacher to death in front of a classroom full of students. 61-year-old Anne Maguire was a Spanish teacher teaching in Leeds. She'd actually worked at the school for 40 years and she was only five months off retirement. However, in April 2014, something absolutely horrific happened. One of her students was 15-year-old Will Cornick. He'd always been described as a smart student who never really caused any trouble. Classmates regarded him as a polite student, but after he got diagnosed with diabetes, his personality seemed to change. In 2013, he tried to join the army, but because of his diagnosis, he was rejected. Being in the army had been his dream, so this was really upsetting for him. After failing to complete his Spanish homework, he was given detention by Anne. He also expressed a wish to her that he wanted to drop Spanish, but she wouldn't let him, which only angered him more. He began to develop a deep-rooted grudge against Anne. Shockingly, he reportedly messaged his friends on Facebook asking if one of them would kill her for him for £10. During one school day, halfway through his Spanish class, Will decided to get up and attack Anne with a knife. The classmates watched on in horror as he chased her out of the classroom. When there, another teacher heard her screams and tried to shield Anne from any more blows from him. Will then allegedly returned to his class and told his classmates how it was a shame that he hadn't killed her. However, Anne did actually pass away from her injuries. Will later admitted that he did plan also to kill two other teachers. One of them was actually pregnant at the time. He's been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. This island has one of the most disturbing histories in America and no one really knows the full truth behind it. So like I said before, this island was owned by multi-millionaire Francis Sheldon, pictured right here. And Francis and a number of other local men from Michigan, including this guy, Gerald S. Richards, ran a boys camp on the island. They would fly kids to the island on this airstrip, kids from the YMCA and other schools and communities in the area. And both the children and the parents of the children who attended this boys camp were told that this was an island of fun where kids could relax. They had big brothers there. It was gonna be totally safe. And this camp ran on this island for a period of years. Then one day, some of the kids who attended the camp began to tell their parents that the counselors or the teachers, the adults that were there on the island, had behaved with them in very, very inappropriate ways. 
They began telling their friends and parents that they were taken into these cabins pictured here on the island. They were assaulted. They were told to remove all of their clothing and that there were cameras all over the place. Well, it turns out that this guy, the multi-millionaire with political and business connections in the area, Francis Sheldon, was running a massive CP ring. And they had been abusing the children on this island under the guise of bringing them to a boys camp for years, recording all of it, selling it across the world. And some of the more affluent clients of their business were even allowed to take trips to the island themselves to see some of these young boys. Now, this story bears an obvious resemblance to the story of Jeffrey Epstein, but there are some very, very strange things that are happening here that nobody knows about and the government still refuses to talk about to this day. So let's talk about this guy, Gerald S. Richards. He was a gym teacher at a local Catholic school who went down for the crimes and he was heavily involved with every aspect of this business, if you know what I mean. Well, it seems like through his political and business connections, Francis Sheldon was actually tipped off that he was about to be arrested and raided and charged with these horrific crimes. So Francis, before he could be brought to justice for these crimes, he actually fled the country in a personal plane. He then moved to France, got remarried, and died in Amsterdam, and never had to pay for any of the crimes that were committed here. But it's when we start talking about the murders that this story really starts to blow my mind. So take a good look at this guy, Chris Bush. This is Christopher Bush's father, Harold Lee Bush. Now, he was an executive with General Motors, and the family was obviously extremely wealthy. They were politically connected, and they were very connected to every business in the area. These guys had a lot of power. But back to Christopher Bush. This guy had assaulted a number of children. He'd been let out of prison, let out of jail in a very, very suspicious way, multiple times, put on bail for serious offenses. And he was a alleged associate of the crime ring that was happening on North Fox Island. Meaning that, like I said earlier, he was one of those people who could afford to actually fly out to the island to do things himself. I'm out of time. Follow for part three. This is where it gets juicy. Shocking case of the Philpots. On the 11th of May 2012, six children were in bed asleep when a huge fire broke out of their home. A smoke roared through the building, and Mairead Philpot, the children's mother, called the emergency services. Their dad, Mick Philpot, was reportedly making heroic attempts to try and save them. However, five children unfortunately died in the fire, and the eldest actually passed away in hospital later on. At first, this appeared to be a tragic accident, but the truth was soon revealed. The fire had been started intentionally with petrol underneath the letterbox. When word got out about who the children's father was, many people were already familiar with him. Mick Philpott was notorious for being outspoken and provocative and had appeared on The Jeremy Kyle Show. He claimed to have had two wives and seemed to be really proud of this. He also had a horrible history of abusive behaviour towards women. He had been convicted for attacking two women with a knife and headbutting a female colleague. A press conference was held about the tragedy that had unfolded. Reporters really expected at this point for the Philpots to come out and appeal to anyone who had any information about the fire. What the Philpots actually did was just kind of came out and started thanking people. They didn't ask for any help with any information about the case at all. The only thing Mick asked for is to be left alone. If this genuinely had nothing to do with the parents, you would think that they would come out and be desperate for more information. Neighbours from across the road actually went to the police and told them that they had seen Mick during the fire. He was outside pretending to cough, not actually going in trying to help rescue his children. Police were now suspicious enough to try and set a trap for the Philpots. They kept them in a hotel room and actually bugged the room. The recording reveals Mick quizzing his wife about how convincing she'd been in her police interview. Locals had also spotted the couple in a pub doing karaoke, dancing and drinking shots. Incredibly strange behaviour for two people who'd just lost their children. It also came out that Mick was reportedly flirting with nurses at the hospital where his son was on a life support machine. The true story of what actually happened was all about Mick Philpott getting revenge on his ex. In early 2012, one of his wives had left him. She walked out with five of their children and Mick just could not take this rejection. He wanted to do something to get her back and wanted custody of his five children with her. He set the fire up to frame the ex to make it look like she'd done it. He wanted to be the heroic dad to save all his children and for his ex to go to prison for it. Mick got life in prison for this. Mariad got 17 years and is now released. I spent a weekend with one of the most notorious killers in Texas. So in my early 20s, I spent a lot of time in South Texas in women's prisons units, helping people find forgiveness and second chances at life. And on this one particular weekend, when we arrived, the correctional officers informed our team that there was a new inmate on the premises. She was only 17 years old and had been tried and convicted as an adult for a very violent crime. 
And because I was the youngest person on our prison team, they voted me to be the one to work with her because she was young, I was young, and she might relate to me and open up to me. Now, I had a rule for myself when I worked with these women to never look up their crimes. I didn't want it to affect my judgment about them or to affect my willingness to help them, so that was just a rule that I always kept. So the correctional officers, they walked me down this long corridor into a classroom where sitting at the table was Erin Caffey. Now, Erin Caffey is a tiny, tiny thing. Now, I'm a tiny person, and I dwarfed her. She's very small, very timid, very soft-spoken, rarely will look you in the eye. And my first thought whenever I lay eyes on her and I sit down across from her is, how can somebody this small and this timid possibly be convicted as an adult for a violent crime? What violence is she possibly capable of? Little did I know. We, we started talking and we kind of started to get to know each other a little bit, cracked a few jokes. I tried to get her to lighten up. And eventually she did start kind of opening up to me and she started volunteering uh, some details about her version of what had happened the night of her crime. And I have to admit, you know, even though I had a rule to really try not to know what people had done, I was very curious because again, here's this tiny little thing. She's 17 years old, looks scared to death. and she's in this facility and well her version of the events that took place the night of the crime led me to believe that she was a victim in all of it and that it was really out of her hands she couldn't stop it and she's haunted by it regrets it every day of her life and she just wishes she could take it all back and y'all she was so convincing just absolutely convincing that I truly believed that she was innocent she had somehow gotten mixed up with the wrong crowd was wrongly convicted and I started brainstorming in my head, like, how can I raise awareness about this and help her get out? Little did I know in my naivety that this young lady was a psychopath. She was very cunning, very manipulative, and the small, mousy, timid, soft-spoken thing was very much a calculated tactic to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. And my time with her started a long season of my life of panic attacks and nightmares, and I'm gonna tell you more about that in part two.